Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Now coming to today's session, uh, which is uh, on the cardiovascular system. We saw that uh, the basic function of uh, every part of the body is to provide the right environment to the cells. The trillions of cells that we have, have exacting requirements very similar to the single-celled organisms. These cells should have food available in their vicinity, oxygen available, and the waste products should not accumulate. Now, to ensure that in that little private pond that each cell has around it, it is important that not only the this fluid surrounding the cells, this pri private pond of each cell, exchange food and oxygen and the waste products, etc., with the blood, but it's also important that this blood should be moving so that fresh blood with fresh oxygen and food is coming along and uh, carrying the waste products away. Now, to ensure this movement, we need a pump and that pump is the heart. And uh, that is what we shall study today, the heart. And of course, the heart has to have a network of tubes or pipes to distribute that blood all over the body and then receive it back when it returns from those parts of the body. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually seen a real heart inside a person when the chest has been opened up, uh, but I'm sure most of you have seen an X-ray of the chest and uh, that X-ray, as you know, looks somewhat like this. The heart is here and you have lungs on either side and uh, uh, this is the right lung. This is the left lung. The heart is on the left side and uh, it may appear the opposite, uh, but that is because uh, we are not looking at our own heart. We are looking at the heart of somebody in front of us and therefore we see a mirror image and, uh, and therefore uh, the left side of that person is on our right hand side and that is how the x-ray looks and that is how uh, the drawings, etc., in medical literature are drawn. Uh, so, uh, throughout the day today, uh, what we'll be doing is we'll drawing we'll be drawing the left side on this side and the right side on this side, and uh, that is how the you see the heart within the and uh, you have this uh, concavity, and uh, which is the abdomen. On the right side, the partition is pushed up by the liver, and on the left side by the stomach. So now let us see what uh, the says. So we draw a group of cells here. And uh, these cells have to be have a bit of fluid around them. And uh, this fluid in turn is in equilibrium with uh, the blood And uh, the arrangement is such that uh, instead of a tube, I'll just draw a line, but these are tubes. Uh, there's a network of tubes here. So that uh, these tubes come very close to the cells. Now these tubes, in fact, uh, are very thin walled and therefore tra transfer can take place across these walls. And these in turn are uh, the branches of uh, thicker vessels, which in turn are branches of still thicker vessels. And uh, the blood keeps flowing in these uh, as a result of the 
action of the heart, which we can show like this, the pump. So this pumps uh, pumps the blood in uh, one of the largest blood vessels that we have, which in turn divides into smaller branches uh, and still smaller branches. And uh, one branch of these goes to every part of the body and within the organ, then it divides and subdivides into still smaller branches. So that, you know, uh, starting with the stem, there is a huge tree uh, of these tubes getting smaller and smaller as they get closer to the cells. And once they are very close to the cells, uh, they, once they are very close to the cells, they are very thin walled and transport can take place across them and they bring fresh food and oxygen uh, to these cells. Now, when the blood emerges from these capillaries, it has undergone a change. And uh, the So we show that this change is uh, the result of the oxygen uh, having been removed. And therefore, that's customary to show that in a bluish color, it's less red than the blood that went in. And uh, uh, this then again returns to the heart. And uh, now it is pumped into the lungs. where oxygen will be added to this and uh, the blood that will come out of the lungs will have this additional oxygen and therefore once again it will be red and uh, now this blood has to return from here sorry, from the lungs to the heart to be pumped again so you can see blood entering this pump and leaving it, and it is entering this pump and uh, leaving it. But then uh, we don't have two hearts, we just have one heart. Whereas we seem to be needing two pumps. Uh, sorry about uh, breaking the heart into two pieces, but then uh, we'll put it together now and see how within that one heart, we actually have two pumps. Now, this does look a bit like the heart, isn't it? And uh, it has four chambers. The upper chambers are called the atria. So this is the right atrium, the left atrium. The chambers at the bottom are the ventricles, right ventricle and the left ventricle. And uh, the blood has to enter and leave these chambers. So there are gaps. A gap here, a gap here, a gap here, and a gap here. And for convenience, let's draw a gap here and a gap here. Okay. So the arrangement is such that blood returns from the lungs after oxygen has been added to it. Here, from here, it is pumped to the left ventricle and from the left ventricle it is pumped uh, to the whole body and after giving its, uh, up its oxygen to the cells of different parts of the body, it uh, returns here, from here it is pumped into the right ventricle and from the right ventricle it goes to the lungs. And then oxygen is added in the lungs. And uh, this blood then returns here. So you can see, in fact, there are two pumps within one heart in a rather complex looking arrangement. But uh, this is how the circulation takes place. And uh, 
and this was uh, this circuit was first uh, sort of worked out through some observations by William Harvey in 1628. And that was just the beginning of the European Renaissance. And uh, his ideas were quite contrary to what the prevailing ideas were. And therefore, he had to wait for 12 years before he could make his ideas public. He was afraid because so much was the uh, fear of contesting authority and the testimony of uh, the ancients because still Europe had not got over the age of convention. And, uh, and therefore, uh, just to explain this little thing that I have explained in a uh, few minutes, uh, he had to write a book of 70 pages and wait for 12 years before making it public, to be more sure, and for the atmosphere to be receptive. And still he was quite afraid. That's what he mentioned in the, those 70 pages that I have quite fear uh, uh, for myself, which means he might be attacked and prosecuted for uh, saying something which is against convention. But anyway, so now you can see that uh, uh, this is how the blood moves. And to ensure that the blood keeps moving uh, in the uh, proper direction, uh, there are valves here. So this will allow flow this way, but not the, in the opposite direction. And there are valves here. So you have valves between the atria and the ventricles and your valves between the two ventricles and the major blood vessels into which. So these valves will snap shut if the blood tries to flow in the opposite direction. Okay. Now let's look at uh, this a uh, little differently, the same arrangement. So let's start with the, the left ventricle now this left ventricle pumps its blood into a major blood vessel called the aorta which then divides into branches and uh, these branches go to different parts of the body Say some would go to the intestines, some would go to the legs, and so on. And some would go, some branches of the aorta would go to the head and neck region. So this sound gets distributed all over the body. So this is going to the intestines. This is going to the legs and the feet. And this is going to the head and neck region. Now, after giving up its oxygen to all these parts of the body, the blood emerges. And now that it is given up its oxygen, we'll draw it in a different color. Now, this process is somewhat opposite of that. We saw the aorta dividing into finer and finer branches, whereas uh, when the blood returns, then uh, these veins through which it returns, they start merging into bigger and bigger veins. And finally, we have two big veins which return the blood to the heart and uh, they come back to the see this part of the heart. So these two veins bring the blood back to the right atrium. And from the right atrium, it flows into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, 
into the lungs, pumped into the lungs, and in the lungs, oxygen is added and carbon dioxide removed. And the result is that now blood is oxygenated and this oxygenated blood then returns to the left atrium. And from the left atrium into the left ventricle, then into the aorta. So, this is how it goes on. Now, the branches of the aorta are called arteries. And generally, the standard abbreviation is a double A. And uh, these uh, are the veins. Not only are these called the arteries, but uh, This is also called an artery, the pulmonary artery. Okay. And uh, this vessel, which is, uh, these are the veins, okay, coming from different parts of the body. And uh, this blood vessel, which is, uh, Carrying the blood from the lungs to the heart is called the pulmonary vein. Okay. Now, one of the common impressions is that arteries carry oxygenated blood, generally called pure blood, and veins carry deoxygenated, that is blood from which oxygen has been removed, and that is impure blood. But here you can see that there is a vein that is carrying the so-called pure blood, and uh, there is an artery which is carrying the so-called impure blood, pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. So the real distinction is not uh, the type of blood they carry, uh, although largely it is true for these large number of arteries and veins, but uh, the distinction is any blood vessel which uh, into which the heart pumps the blood out. That is an artery. And the blood vessels which bring the blood back to the heart, that is a vein. So all the veins, all these blood vessels which are bringing deoxygenated blood back from different parts of the body to the heart, they are veins. The blood vessels which are bringing the blood from the lungs back to the heart, those are also veins, although the blood is oxygenated. In the same way, the blood vessels which pump the blood out of the heart to in different parts of the body, those are arteries. But then the blood vessel which pumps the blood out of the heart to the lungs, that is also an artery. Okay, So, uh, whatever the heart pumps out, that goes on in an artery and it returns the heart through a vein. So, the heart receives blood and gives away blood. It receives and pumps out. And uh, that is the basis of uh, the Indian name, the Hindi and Sanskrit name for uh, the heart. It's a combination of Hri uh, and Dai. Hri is Hari, the one who takes away. And Dai, Data, the divine, who gives. So the divine gives and the divine takes away. In the same way, the heart also gives and takes away. It does both these things. So that sort of is the, uh, which means that the ancients had some idea that the heart is receiving the blood and then pumping it out. And uh, that's how this name was given. And of course, uh, in ordinary language, we also use this for uh, uh, a variety of emotions, uh, like hearty congratulations and a hearty meal and so on and so forth. And uh, the truth is coming straight from my heart and so on and so forth. So uh, that's the distinction between arteries and veins. And then we have valves, which ensure one way flow through all this. But then it's not only the valves that are required, 
to make the blood flow, we also need a difference in the pressure. And uh, the blood flows from a high pressure to a low pressure area. And uh, let's just start with the uh, to talk about the left ventricle, uh, which has uh, just about the highest pressure that you see anywhere in the heart. And that is required. Pump blood at a high pressure is required here in the left ventricle because this blood has to travel all over the body. And therefore, to start with, it should get a really good push. In contrast, on the right side, in the right ventricle, it has to go only to the lungs, a small network of blood vessels, and therefore the push required is not that hard. So in the left ventricle, it gives a real hard push to the blood, and uh, it gets into these, uh, the big artery, and as it travels farther and farther away, gets into smaller and smaller blood vessels, the pressure keeps falling, as you can imagine. You can visualize that, so that by the time it reaches the capillaries, the pressure has fallen quite low, and by the time it comes out of the capillaries and flows into the vein, the blood is flow is the pressure is still lower, and so that by the time it returns to the uh, right atrium, the pressure is almost negligible. It's a very low pressure. Now, to be able to receive this blood which has returned from the whole body into the right ventricle, or to receive this blood which has come from the lungs into the heart into the atria, the atria uh, therefore become low chamber, sorry, low pressure areas. So these have a low pressure so that they can receive the blood. And uh, uh, to be able to receive, the at that time, the ventricles should be relaxing because if the ventricle is relaxed, then only the pressure in the ventricles can be low. And during uh, relaxation, uh, the ventricular pressure falls to zero. So here at least there is some pressure building up because of the blood flowing in. And here there is a zero pressure during relaxation. And that's how the blood is able to flow from the atrium into the ventricle. And uh, to make one last effort towards the pumping of the blood from the atria into the ventricles, the atria do contract a little bit towards the end of this flow from the atria to the ventricles. They contract a little bit. But then that contraction is not indispensable, which means that uh, the blood, uh, much of the blood flows passively as a result of here at least there being some pressure and some pressure continuing to build up because the atria are filling, they are receiving blood and here their pressure being zero during relaxation. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, because of this pressure differential, the flow continues, and it's only one last bit during which 20 to 30% of the bl blood uh, that is pumped into the ventricle may be pumped in as a result of the atrial contraction. Why I'm emphasizing this is because there can be situations in which the atria do not have any effective contraction, but the heart can still continue to function because that is not critical. What is critical is that the ventricle should be able to contract properly. And uh, how that happens is that this, when this blood flow continues into the relaxed ventricle, eventually the ventricular pressure will start rising. And here the pressure would start falling after that last ditch uh, effort at pumping some blood as a result of atrial contraction. And uh, the result is that now the pressure in the ventricle is higher than in the atria. The ventricles are full, the pressure has gone up. And therefore, this well will be snapped shut. This well, uh, through which the blood is flowing from the atria into the ventricles, on the left side, it is called the bicuspid or the mitral well. And uh, now, the ventricle is a closed cavity. It was closed on this side, and it was so far closed on this side when the ventricle was relaxing. And it remains closed because the pressure in the aorta is higher. Now, now that the ventricle is a closed cavity and it starts contracting, the pressure builds up to a level which is now higher than the aorta. And when that happens, this valve opens up. And when this valve opens up, the blood enters the aorta. And uh, it will continue to flow till the pressure in the aorta is higher than the pressure in the left ventricle. And then this valve will be snapped shut. And uh, then, once again, the ventricle is a closed cavity because this is shut. This was already shut earlier. And the result would be that as the blood continues to flow into the atria, the pressure here will build up, rise a little above the ventricular pressure and come here. So the key thing is that the left ventricle, every time it's a closed cavity, if it contracts, the pressure builds up to a high level. And when it is a closed cavity and relaxes, the pressure falls steeply. Because you can imagine that if the volume remains the same, any chamber which will contract 
will have a steep rise in the pressure. And uh, if, when the, if that chamber with the same amount of blood relaxes, there will be a steep fall in the pressure. So that's why there's a huge fluctuation in the pressure in the ventricles. And we're talking mainly about left ventricle where this fluctuation is really enormous. During uh, contraction, it builds up to a level of about 120 millimeters of mercury. And during relaxation, it falls to zero millimeters of mercury. So that much is the fluctuation. Now, during contraction, the pressure that we get is the systolic pressure. During relaxation, it is the diastolic pressure. But then how about the aorta into which the blood is being pumped? Uh, does that experience the same fluctuation? Uh, only partly. Because when the pressure is 120, uh, it is pushing the blood into the aorta. The aortic pressure also becomes 120. But uh, when this is, uh, when the pressure eventually in the aorta becomes slightly higher than in the ventricle, the valve snaps shut, the pressure in the ventricle falls steeply to zero. In the aorta, it does not fall steeply to zero. It comes down uh, at the most to uh, 80 or so, something like 80. And uh, the blood pressure that we measure is the pressure in the aorta and its bigger branches. Now, while traveling from the aorta into these bigger arteries, the pressure does not change much. The pressure changes only when it gets into smaller arteries. So that is why you find that the blood pressure is about 120 by 80. Uh, so this is the systolic pressure when the ventricle is contracting, uh, the left ventricle is contracting, and this is the diastolic pressure, the pressure during the period when this left ventricle is relaxing. Its own pressure is falling towards zero, but the aortic pressure is not falling to zero. Now, how is this achieved? This is achieved because aorta and the bigger arteries are elastic arteries. So you can imagine it like this. Say, say this is an elastic chamber here. Hmm? So the whole artery is elastic, but sort of to make understanding clear, what I'm doing, I've drawn an elastic balloon here. So the blood is pumped in here at 120. What will happen as a result of this is one is that this balloon will get distended. Hmm? And uh, it continues here at 120 and the balloon has got distended. Now, when the flow here stops, when the left ventricle, this valve is shut and the left ventricle uh, is no longer in communication with the aorta, the pressure here stops falling. The pressure here will not fall to zero because what will happen is when the blood stops flowing, this balloon will start closing in on the blood that is within it. So it will, because it is elastic in nature, and the result is that as this balloon closes in on that blood, the blood will still continue flowing and there'll be still some pressure maintained in this vessel. So that's how during the relaxation of the ventricle, during diastole, the arterial pressure, pressure in the arteries does not fall to zero, it falls to only about 80. And before it falls any further, the whole cycle is over. And that now this 80 is below the pressure that builds up in the ventricle in its contraction, it can build up to 120, but the moment it goes a little above 80, say 82 or 83, this valve will open and will start pumping and will keep pumping uh, at a pressure of 120, which had built up here, and that is the pressure which will be transmitted to the aorta. So it is because of the elasticity of these. But then by the time it has returned to the ventricles after going through all those smaller arteries and capillaries and so on, by that time it has fallen to almost zero and that is how it returns here. And uh, it's only because of the filling that the atrial pressure goes up. So in the atria, the pressure goes up primarily because of the filling with the blood. In the ventricles, the pressure rises and falls because of active contraction and relaxation. And this contraction and relaxation is taking place during certain phases when the it's a ventricle is a completely closed cavity. So that's how there is a steep rise and a steep fall. Uh, so I try to sort of uh, make you a little more familiar with the mechanisms behind some of these terms which are commonly used, like how much is the blood pressure and so on and so forth and how this happens. Uh, so now you have some idea of uh, how the uh, blood pressure uh, is about 120 by 80 and uh, what it really means. So it is the pressure with which the blood is being pumped into the aorta. Now, another thing that you would have noticed is that uh, when the atria are emptying the blood into the ventricle, uh, at least towards the end of this process, they contract. And throughout this period, the left ventricle was relaxed, which means when the atria contract, 
the ventricle is relaxed so they can receive the blood. On the other hand, when the ventricle is pumping the blood out, at that time, the atria are relaxed. That is how they can release, receive the blood, which will be pumped again in the next cycle. So the when the ventricles contract, the atria are relaxed. And uh, when the atria contract, the ventricles are relaxed. So they don't contract simultaneously. Both the atria contract simultaneously, both the ventricles contract simultaneously, but the atria and the ventricles don't contract simultaneously. And that is important because if they contract simultaneously, what would happen is that the heart will completely sort of uh, squeeze out blood from all its chambers and uh, then there'll be nothing. Then how will it fill up? So it is because uh, of this alternation that when the atria uh, contract, the ventricles are relaxed, that the ventricles can receive the blood and fill up. And when the ventricles empty that blood by contracting, that is the time atria relax so that they can receive blood returning from the lungs or different parts of the body, depending upon whether it is the right side or the left side. They can receive that blood, fill up, and get ready for the next phase of contraction when they'll fill the ventricles again. So this is another important thing that the atria and the con ventricles don't contract at the same time. They're called contraction and relaxation alternate. Now, how is this type of alternation achieved? Let's try and understand that. That alternation is achieved because the contraction in the cardiac muscle, as is true of uh, also the other muscles in the body, is associated with a electrical activity. Minute currents, but all the same, it's electrical activity. And as this electrical impulse spreads through the muscle, the impulse is then followed by a mechanical action that is contraction. That takes place also in the heart. Uh, now, in case of the heart, the arrangement is such that uh, if there is an electrical impulse in any part of the atria, it spreads to it spreads to the both the atrias uh, quickly if there is an electrical impulse in any part of the ventricle that also spreads quickly to the both the ventricles but uh, the impulse does not spread from the atria to the ventricles or from the ventricles to the atria that is ensured by having what is called the fibrous skeleton in the heart which means that it is fibrous tissue which not only gives shape to the heart and makes it firm, that's why it's called the skeleton, but that is the tissue which does not allow transmission of these electrical impulses. And therefore, an electrical impulse cannot travel from the atria to the ventricles and from the ventricles to the atria. It, uh, that electrical impulse can spread either throughout the atria or throughout the ventricles. Yet, you know, you need some sort of a transmission, otherwise how will rhythmic activity take place? So now, for that, there are two things which now we'll try and see. One is that how is the rate of the heart ensured that it is about 70 times a minute? And how is it that uh, the impulse uh, spreads for, to both the atria and after a little delay, it spreads to both the ventricles. So there's a gap so that the two will not, the atria and the ventricles will not contract simultaneously. Now, the beginning of this electrical impulse is in a specialized tissue called the SA node or the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node or the SA node is in the right atrium and the property of this SA node is that it discharges electrical impulses at a uh, relatively fixed rate rhythmically on its own. When we say on its own or spontaneously, strictly speaking, nothing is spontaneous. There's always a reason behind it. But for all practical purposes, we can say that this just keeps discharging. It doesn't require any stimulus from outside to be able to uh, discharge these impulses rhythmically and regularly and uh, this it can go on doing uh, 70 times a minute for uh, uh, more than 70 years. Here's an example in front of you whose SA node has been doing that for almost 75 years now. It's uh, remarkable that uh, the heart con uh, this activity continues, the heart continues to beat uh, around 70 times a minute for 
almost 100 years in some people or sometimes even more than 100 without getting tired. This itself is a remarkable feat. We should once again make us uh, admire the divine who has created such a wonderful pump, uh, which goes on working on its own as a result of the discharge of these impulses from the SA node on its own, apparently spontaneously. Now this impulse originating here spreads throughout the atria and leads to contraction of both the atria simultaneously. But it doesn't spread to the ventricles because there is fibrous tissue guarding the uh, junction of these atria and the ventricles. However, it has to spread to the ventricles. Otherwise, how will the ventricles contract? And uh, for that, we have a special arrangement. Here, there's another similar thing at the junction of the atria and the ventricles, which is called the AV node. Now, the AV node does allow transmission across. But again, the property of the AV node is that it allows conduction only after a delay. So it spreads throughout the atria. The atria contracts simultaneously. When this impulse reaches the AV node, the AV node allows transmission only after a delay. And you can understand this delay is important so that the ventricles will not contract at the same time. Now, from here, this continues into what is called the bundle of his. And this bundle of his then divides into branches, the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. And these bundle branches can transmit this impulse. So the transmission into this bundle and these bundle branches, the right and the left bundle branch, uh, this transmission uh, takes place after a certain delay. Once this delay has been overcome, then the transmission through these bundle and bundle branches is quick. And from here, it spreads to the muscles on both sides, ventricular muscle, that also is quick. And once it spreads to the ventricles, the ventricles contract simultaneously because there's quick transmission of impulse from these bundle branches into this. Now, that is a sort of beautiful arrangement here. And uh, not only that, this also has a certain reserve in it. The reserve is that the SA node can discharge spontaneously. The AV node also has a potential uh, although it potential remains hidden, the potential of discharging impulses uh, rhythmically and spontaneously like the SA node. It not only allows delayed transmission, it also has a capacity to discharge spontaneously. Which means that if the SA node is not functioning, this can take over. And as we saw, the atrial contraction is not critical. It's the ventricular contraction which is critical. Atrial contraction is not critical for survival. It only pumps 25 to 30 percent of all the blood that flows from the atria into the ventricles. Seven, more than 70 percent can flow on its own passively as a result of the pressure difference. So the atrial contraction is not critical. And therefore, even if the atria do not contract because the SA node is not discharging, this itself can take over and send. But then you'll say, how is it that normally it doesn't show that potential? Because the rate at which it discharges spontaneously lower than the SA node. See, SA node discharges at the rate of about 80 times a minute, AV node only at about 40 to 50 times a minute. You can imagine it like this. Suppose there's a train, huh? which has not one but two engines. And the bogey is behind it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the front are the two engines. And all those steam engines are not common, but to show that these are different from the bogies, I'll show smoke coming out of them. So these are the two engines. Now this engine is running at the speed of 80 kilometers per hour. And this engine is also running, but at, the, at a pace which will pull the train at 40 kilometers per hour. So this engine is, uh, we are pressing the accelerator to such an extent that if this is working, the train will move at 80. And here we are pressing the accelerator in such a way it will pull the train only up to the speed of 40 kilometers per hour. At what speed will the train move? 80 kilometers per hour, because that is the train. But suppose this engine fails. The train will not stop. The train will now start moving at 40 kilometers per hour. Right? So it's something like this that is possible here in the heart. And uh, that is what this type of blockage is in transmission or blockage in transmission from here uh, throughout both the ventricles are different types of abnormalities which give rise to 
arrhythmias in the heart. The heart does not beat very rhythmically, but the person does not die immediately. So this is a broad sort of uh, understanding of what arrhythmias are like in the heart and things like uh, that there's a heart block, first degree heart block, second degree heart block, third degree heart block, bundle branch block. So all these blockages mean some sort of a block in this conduction system, this entire system, SA node, AV node, bundle of his, bundle branches, right bundle branch, left bundle branch, all this together is called the conduction system of the heart because it's conducting the impulse which normally originates in the SA node. It's transmitting that, conducting that throughout the heart in a way that it leads to a proper rhythmic contraction of the whole heart in such a way that both the atria contract simultaneously and then after a little delay, both the ventricles contract simultaneously. Now this electrical activity, then in turn, this electrical activity gives rise to uh, and uh, it's an electrical activity which can be picked up also on the surface of the chest. This electrical activity of the heart can be picked up on the chest and that is what uh, gives us the electrocardiogram, the ECG. Okay. Now let's see what uh, the different waves in the ECG are about. Now normally an ECG looks somewhat like this. Now this is the P wave, this is the QRS complex, and this is the T wave. Now the P wave corresponds to the atrial uh, contraction. The QRS to the ventricular contraction and the T wave to the ventricular relaxation. Now I'll ask what about the uh, atrial relaxation? Atrial relaxation wave is not seen because that coincides with more or less with the ventricular contraction and it gets submerged in this big QRS complex. So we don't see the wave of atrial relaxation. So atrial contraction, ventricular contraction and ventricular relaxation. And after ventricular relaxation will come soon after that, the P wave, which will be the atrial contraction of the next cycle. So this is uh, uh, why the ECG looks a bit like this and we will not go into this any further. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, we can take them up. Uh, but after that, what I will do is, I'll go to a PowerPoint presentation, which will give you a little more realistic picture of how these structures actually look within the body. So any questions at this point? Sometimes um, sports people or people who exercise a lot, they have that dark and thick veins. Is that a good, bad? Is there something significant in the size of the veins, doctor? Well, actually, it's exercising should not normally lead to thick veins. What you mean by thick veins is probably varicose veins, prominent veins in the legs. Is that what you mean? No. I just have noticed that people who um, go to the gym a lot or exercise a lot, and this question actually comes on behalf of my daughter, who's a sports person. She keeps thinking that thick veins are good, whereas I didn't have that impression at all. 
and I just wanted to check. According to her, it indicates fitness, but I did not know for sure. So I'm trying to understand if there is any indication. So people who exercise strenuously, they seem to have thicker veins on their arms, especially. Um, and if it's an irrelevant question, please ignore it. No, I'm not sure if exercise has anything to do with it. We all tend to have uh, veins which are less prominent or more prominent. That seems to be an inbuilt characteristics. Uh, you know, nurses usually find very easy to get the blood sample from one patient, but not so easy from another. That is because how prominent their veins are. Uh, if maybe exercise makes the person remain, uh, not, uh, not get overweight, that will certainly keep the veins prominent. If that same person puts on a lot of weight, those veins will be less prominent. So that you can understand. So it has probably more to do with the uh, fitness has anything to do with it. It probably means that uh, the uh, person has not put on much weight. There's not too much extra subcutaneous tissue and therefore the veins are quite prominent. Uh, what happens in exercise actually is something which we can we'll talk about in the next class that how a person adapts to exercise, what are the changes that a person goes through as a result of regular heavy exercise and uh, why some people who take heavy exercise regularly may occasionally get a heart attack. This has become a little, once again, come to the front after Raju Srivastava's death. Uh, so why this type of cases keep happening off and on from time to time? So these are things which we'll discuss in the next class. Thank you so much, Doctor. Any other question? Sir, I had a question. So when your heart stops um, and you uh, do CPR, um, what happens to these signals? I mean, how does the heart um, um, get activated again when you when you perform that CPR? Uh, yes, when you thump the chest to sort of mm -hmm. make the heart start again, if it has stopped, uh, that helps by just providing a mechanical stimulus. And because... Uh, uh, sometimes that helps uh, in uh, restarting the heart, but uh, that is only sort of in an emergency when uh, uh, you do not have much facilities available. Otherwise, what is done in the hospitals is to give a strong electrical shock to the heart and uh, it's hoped that after that, the heart will restart again. Because when the heart has stopped, it has not really completely stopped. It has go under gone into what is called a fibrillation, which means a low level disorganized contraction which is ineffective and uh, one can restore that rhythm sometimes either through cpr or through a strong electric shock okay thank you and uh, you mentioned that these electrical signals that run within the muscles of the heart um is it our brain who sending that uh, impulse no oh, that's a good question as i said i mean this is apparently spontaneous which means that the brain is not involved in sending this. And that is why even in an unconscious person or a, uh, this heart continues to beat, when the brain function is uh, almost gone, even then the heart may continue to beat. Uh, that's because spontaneous. However, it can be modulated, which means the rate can go up and the rate can go down. And in that, the nervous system and the endocrine system both come in because the requirements of uh, the rate at which and the force which the heart should be beating, they keep changing from time to time. And therefore, this modulation should be possible. And as everywhere, all this modulation of function or regulation or control so that uh, in spite of the changes in the requirements of the body, the environment of each cell still remains favorable for survival. That is ensured by having regulatory systems which can step up or step down the activity of organs like the heart and the lungs and so on. So now how the cardiovascular activity is regulated, that also we'll take up in the next class. Thank you. Any other questions? So if there are no other questions, then we can, uh, again, I will share the screen again, and hopefully you'll again have another opportunity after the PPT is over. It's only a short PPT with a few slides. This, uh, the YES courses and the rest of the YES project is a part of the 150th birth anniversary celebrations of Sri Aurobindo. 
and uh, the 50th anniversary of India's independence. Uh, before I go further, the realistic pictures, anatomical pictures that you see in this uh, presentation are from this book, uh, Principles of Anatomy and Physiology, uh, the 10th edition, which was uh, brought out by Tortora and Grabowski. Uh, Tortora is the person who has been throughout there from the first edition till the last. Oh, probably the latest edition is uh, the 14th edition, but these pictures are from the 10th edition, which was jointly brought out by Tortora and Grabowski. Let me start with uh, in this uh, short little poem by a 19th century physician who worked in the practice in the Boston area in the United States, Oliver Wendell Holmes. No rest that throbbing slave may ask, forever quivering over his task, while far and wide a common jet leaps forth to fill the woven net, which, is, which in unnumbered crossing tides the flood of burning life divides, then kindling each decaying part creeps back to find the throbbing heart. So this is about the heart and the circulation, as you can see. Uh, the heart is like that slave that never asks for any rest, just continues to throb. And uh, uh, as it does so, it sends jets of uh, blood far and wide. This blood travels through a network, the woven net, as he has called it. And there are an unnumbered of crossings because of the various branches and uh, the hurdles apparently that it goes through as a result of which the pressure falls to almost zero by the time it has returned to the heart. But as it is doing so, it supports the burning life. Burning life because the process of life is somewhat similar to combustion. Like, you know, uh, if you burn fuel, uh, you get heat energy uh, with the help of fuel and oxygen. Here also in the body, we have fuel in the form of our food and we use oxygen to get energy. And in both cases, the waste product is carbon dioxide. So the process of life is often compared to combustion or burning. But all the same, it is a very regulated burning so that uh, there is no real fire. Only a little bit of heat dissipates. The rest of the energy can be used for the processes of life. And this is possible because energy is all the energy available from the fuel is not released in one installment. It is released in small pockets, a little bit at a time so that it can be used properly. And uh, after it has uh, taken care of uh, each decaying part, which means part which was starving for uh, oxygen to, and food to be brought, after that, the blood finds its way back to the throbbing heart to be pumped once more. Now, this is uh, the entire arterial system and the venous system shown in two pictures for convenience, but actually the same person will have both the arterial and the venous systems. Uh, this is uh, the chest, uh, the heart here and the lungs on the two sides and the outside. On the outside, we have this bony cage with these ribs and the muscles between these ribs. And you can see uh, this uh, blood vessels, a big blood vessel coming out of the heart going towards the head, the carotid arteries, and blood returning from the head uh, through these veins. Uh, this is uh, the anterior view of the heart. Anterior means the front view. So when you look at it from the front, this is how the heart looks. And a uh, uh, bit of fat here, and uh, some uh, the, this big aorta, and uh, the blue colored vessels are the veins that are bringing the blood back to the right atrium. And uh, this uh, blue is uh, the pulmonary artery, which is taking the blood from the uh, right ventricle towards the lungs and so on. This is the posterior view. That is when you look at the heart from the back side. You'll get a little more clear view of certain things and less clear view of others. Uh, which is quite uh, understandable. This is the pulmonary artery bringing the blood from the uh, right ventricle. And uh, these are the various veins bringing the blood from the different parts of the body. And this is the aorta taking the oxygenated blood to different parts of the body from the left ventricle. <clears throat> now, this is when you cut open the heart along its length. This is the frontal section. So you can see the inside of the heart. And uh, you can see now a bit of this fibrous skeleton, which I was talking about. 
and uh, this is where the AV node is, and these are probably the bundle branches and so on. So you can see both the chambers of the heart, the uh, right ventricle, sorry, right atrium and the right ventricle, left atrium and the left ventricle. And uh, uh, along with that, one more thing you'll see is the wells. These are the wells between the atria and the ventricles. And here are the wells guarding the opening into the pulmonary artery and into the aorta. Aortic well will be somewhere here, it's probably hidden. But anyway, the important thing that I wanted to show you was uh, that uh, these valves have these fibers extending and at the end of these fibers, there is again a small little muscle called the papillary muscles. These uh, fibers are have at their end a muscle uh, which uh, is the papillary muscle. Now, why muscle, this little muscle here? That is required because uh, when the ventricle contracts, if uh, the result will be that the distance between the valve and this attachment to the ventricle will be reduced. If this gets reduced, the valve will get flabby. Now, that is the time when we do not want the blood to flow uh, back into the atria. These are the atrioventricular valves, valves separating the atria from the ventricles. So you do not want the blood to flow back into the atria as a result of ventricular con uh, contraction. You want it to go only to the aorta. Now, what happens is that when the ventricle contracts, these muscles also contract. The result is that the distance between the atrioventricular valve and the ventricular wall does not reduce in spite of the ventricular contraction. If it does not reduce, the valve does not get flabby and the valve still remains tight. So that all that wisdom is packed into the heart. Now this is coronary circulation. That is uh, uh, the blood vessels which supply the heart. So right at the beginning of the aorta, there are these branches, uh, which are called the coronary arteries, which supply the heart. And like from other organs, the blood returns from the heart through these veins called the cardiac veins. So these are the coronary arteries and the cardiac veins. Uh, shown here. Uh, and uh, you might say that, well, the heart itself is full of so much blood, then uh, why does it need a blood supply of its own? Uh, that has been sort of beautifully explained through a simile by Deepak Chopra. He says that the people who work in the bank are surrounded by money all the time, and yet they need a salary for the, themselves. So that, that's uh, sort of one way to understand why the heart itself needs uh, a blood supply, although it has it is full of blood all the time. And uh, to put it more sort of uh, scientifically, why it is required is because you have the entire thickness. And we have seen that uh, the oxygen has to reach every cell of the uh, body, including every cell in the cardiac muscle. And for that to happen, uh, it is essential that uh, uh, because if the blood in the cavity of the heart will not be able to travel through all that thickness of the muscle and reach near every cell. So, uh, as in the other parts of the body, we need a network which will take the blood in close proximity to every cell within the wall of the heart, every cell that constitutes the cardiac muscle. Of course, the heart is not all muscle, but it's predominantly muscle, uh, as you can see. And again, you know, the heart is not just kept bare like this. It has a thin coating, uh, the uh, serous pericardium, and at a little distance from it is a thicker covering called the fibrous pericardium. Uh, and uh, the fibrous pericardium tethers it in proper position, keeps it in proper shape so that it remains at a fixed place in the chest. And the serous pericardium it forms another uh, little covering all over the heart. Between these two, the fibrous and the serous pericardium is again a small bit of fluid. That fluid acts as a lubricant so that the movement of the heart is friction free. So all this is also a part of the structure of the heart and the structures around it. Now, uh, you'll find this topic discussed in the fourth chapter, Blood on the Move, of this book, The Human Machine, and uh, much greater detail in these two books, Fundamentals of Physiology and Understanding Medical Physiology. And uh, this book not only has beautiful pictures about the principles of anatomy and physiology, it also has uh, uh, beautiful text it's about a thousand pages long, but uh, it's uh, 
an extremely well written book, and that's how it has stood the test of time. Now it is in the fourteenth edition. And this is a picture of uh, Shurabindo Ashram, Delhi branch, the place where I live and work. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write to us on yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Shurabindo for making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there. Any questions? Uh, how does sodium affect blood pressure? Why are people with high BP told to reduce salt in diet? Yes, uh, it's because uh, uh, the uh, contraction of smooth muscle, whether it is in the heart or whether it is in the arterial wall, involves uh, an exchange of electrolytes across the cell. And that is what uh, in turn leads to electrical activity. And uh, therefore, high sodium levels can be associated with blood pressure. Having said that, uh, it doesn't happen in everybody, which means there are people who are salt-sensitive hypertension and there are people who are not sensitive to salt. And this seems to be a genetic trait. Those who have a salt-sensitive hypertension are told to avoid salt. Another important thing to remember is that all of us do need some salt also. And uh, this is uh, ensured by some salt or sodium. When we say salt, we are meaning sodium. Of course, there are many salts. Potassium chloride is also a salt. Uh, but uh, we mean sodium chloride. Either enough of, enough of sodium uh, salts in the food that we take, which means that uh, whether a person has salt-sensitive hypertension or salt-insensitive or whether a person has no hypertension at all. If this person will stop taking salt, the person will not suffer from salt deficiency. How the other way around is possible. If the person takes too much salt, much more table salt than is even ordinarily taken by most people, then this person, in spite of being not salt sensitive, might develop high blood pressure, which means that it's all a question of uh, challenge and response. So if the person is very sensitive, even the normal amount of table salt might give him high blood pressure. If he is insensitive, it will need much more, which means we should know which are the foods which everybody should preferably avoid so that sodium intake is not so much that uh, the person gets hypertension, even if the person does, is not salt sensitive. And those foods are uh, things like uh, pickles, chutneys, papad. These are the high salt foods. So these are the foods to avoid, take as little as possible to reduce the sodium intake. And of course, table salt, if it is used in vegetables and dals, etc., should be kept on the lower side. How much lower? That, you know, actually one gets used to. Uh, there are households in which they put a, quite a bit more and if they put a little less, there's a complaint that today the salt is less. There are some households who put only that much which feeds less to this family and they get used to it. And of course, people can get used to also uh, eating food entirely without salt. Uh, of course, uh, if they are very keen that uh, one should get the right taste from food, then they can add some potassium chloride. That is what the doctors tell that you have to take a salt-free diet, but then add a little potassium chloride. It will give you not the same taste, but compensate partly for uh, the absence of salt. That reminds me of an anecdote. Uh, when Shirobindo had just gone to Pondicherry, he had only four or five young uh, persons staying with him who were with him in the freedom struggle. Uh, and uh, these young boys went for uh, games in the evening. And... Uh, uh, he did not. He was not a very sports type of a person. So he stayed at uh, in the at home uh, with uh, uh, doing all his scholarly work, reading and writing and so on. Now, the these young boys used to treat him like a guru. So he was not asked to cook the food. They used to cook the food for him. And uh, he wanted to have an early dinner. So what they used to do was to cook the dinner, then go for their games. Sri will eat in their absence. And when they came back, they came and had the dinner. One day it so happened that... Uh, uh, when they returned from sports and had their dinner, they found that uh, there was only one vegetable that they had made. There was not much money, you know, uh, living from hand to mouth uh, those days, soon after 1910, uh, when Shirobindo went to Pondicherry. So when these young boys returned from sports one day, they found there was only one vegetable they had made and that vegetable had no salt at all. So the next day, they asked Shirobindo, did you find anything wrong with the food? He said, no. Then they told him we had forgotten to add salt. And his answer was very interesting. He said, just as salt has a taste, saltlessness also has a taste.
question why doctors advise person to take salt with low blood pressure when they feel dizzy it's just the opposite logic that uh, if the person has low blood pressure maybe extra salt will help him it doesn't always help what actually this person is first thing don't worry because high blood pressure is a problem by and large low blood pressure is not a problem the second thing is that this low blood pressure creates a minor reversible acute problem when you change the posture because you know when we shift the posture from the lying down to sitting or sitting to standing uh, the blood has to be pumped more against gravity because in lying down the gravity is not in action so less force is required uh, when we stand maximum force is required to pump the blood to the upper parts of the body now this is automatically achieved within a few seconds there are regulatory mechanisms again some of which we shall see in the next class which ensure that when we change the posture these regulatory mechanisms ensure that the blood will continue to flow satisfactorily uh, even after the change of posture and we normally don't notice it but in these people who whom the normally the blood pressure is on the lower side when they change the posture it is quite possible that uh, the blood flow to the upper parts of the body may drop suddenly when they shift from say lying down to standing and that's how they may feel dizzy and may faint so the precaution to be taken is to do it in steps not straight away from lying down to standing but from lying down to sitting sit for a while and then from sitting to standing and if it is so severe that you still feel fainting then keep something close to the bed hold that while shifting from sitting to standing this applies not only to people who have low blood pressure it applies also to elderly people like uh, every other function in the body with aging these regulatory mechanisms can also become a little weaker so an elderly person is also advised not to shift the posture suddenly and uh, shift it in steps and have something handy to hold while shifting from even sitting to standing so that uh, if there is a dizziness you can again sit back on the bed without falling and now this applies this has application also in the yogic postures and uh, sometimes you know some people find that say in surya namaskar when they are going from uh, say padahastasan uh, to the next one which is just uh, standing up and raising the limbs they can have a dizzying spell during that or say from uh, lying down uh, they come to the standing posture in any uh, posture say from after lying down postures suppose they have to do standing postures after that or even say if they are shifting from uh, uh, the vajrasan to ushtrasan so in vajrasan after vajrasan they have done shashank asan in which the head went completely down so no gravity was required if after that they suddenly come up to vajrasan and then go to ushtrasan and stand on their knees again they might get a dizzying spell which means that all these movements have to be done a little slowly giving time to the body to adapt and adjust that's all what is required then this dizzying uh, spell will not be there is a chat question which has suddenly appeared will you be discussing a few cardiovascular diseases yes i will in the next session we'll talk about uh, the coronary artery disease and high blood pressure the two major uh, common diseases of the cardiovascular system this is an integrated approach to health sciences we are not dividing it into anatomy and physiology so there were some references to diseases even today next time the focus will be more on disease but then you will keep getting reminders of Uh, anatomy and physiology as in well so it's a totally integrated approach and of course integrating it also with the uh, spirituality and yoga that is the type of synthesis we are trying to achieve through these sessions there are no more questions in the chat box so in case anybody wants to like ask they can unmute and ask or uh, maybe then if there are no more questions we can end today's session so thank you everyone for joining in once again